it is my pleasure to welcome you to this edition of our year-long celebration of the DGA's 75th anniversary. These events embody our 75th anniversary theme of Game Changers, honoring directors whose work forever changed the game in film and television and influenced generations of filmmakers around the world. Tonight is no exception. Francis Ford Coppola is one of the most influential and innovative filmmakers of our time. As a director, writer, producer, and technological pioneer, Francis's body of work has helped shape contemporary cinema, not just in America, but around the world. We'll hear tonight from three directors, P.T. Anderson, Catherine Hardwick, and David O. Russell, as they illustrate Francis's influence, not only on them, but of other, other filmmakers of their generation. Moderating this discussion is Michael Apted, chairman of our 75th anniversary committee, to celebrate the incomparable Francis Ford Coppola. Thank you, Taylor. I think it's fair to say that uh, Francis Ford Coppola has directed some of the most celebrated films of all time. Godfather and Godfather Part Two, for which he won two DGA awards, The Conversation, Apocalypse Now, and The Godfather Part Three, which he was nominated for three more DGA awards. Francis was honored with the DGA Lifetime Achievement Award in 1998, and he's also collected a fistful of Oscars. But uh, Francis' influence lies not just in the awards he's won or the films he's directed, but also in the example he's set and the impact he's made on young directors. Even from an early point in his career, Francis worked to provide young independent filmmakers to give them freedom from studio interference. George Lucas, who we honored last month, told a story here last month about a preview of his film, American Graffiti, where the studio head thoroughly disliked the film and threatened not to release it. Francis got out his checkbook in the theater lobby and offered to buy it. The studio head withdrew the threat, released the film, it was a huge hit, and George's commercial career was launched. So there's a bit of the godfather in Francis. <laughs> so later on he became interested in advancing technology that would allow directors to more fully express their vision in modern filmmaking, including innovations like pre-visualization, electronic editing and experimentation with high definition. So please welcome tonight's game changer, Francis Ford Coppola. So while Francis gets mic up, let me introduce these three innovative directors who are going to discuss the films with Francis. David O. Russell's career was launched with Spanking the Monkey, which he followed with Flirting with Disaster, Three Kings, I Heart Huckabee, and earlier this year was nominated by the DGA and the Academy for his latest film, The Fighter. Catherine Hardwick was a distinguished production designer with a string of credits, including David's Three Kings, before she moved effortlessly into directing her own tough depictions of life in Thirteen and Lords of Dogtown. She then directed the mega-hit Twilight, and her latest film, Red Riding Hood, opened in cinemas earlier this month. Catherine. Paul came to prominence with films Hard Eight, Boogie Nights, Magnolia, and Punch Drunk Love. He was nominated for the DGA and Academy Award for his film There Will Be Blood, and he also has three Academy Writing nominations. So each of these panelists spent some time choosing clips to illustrate the points they'd like to make about Francis and his life and career as a director, and we thank you for that. 
my role here, I'm just the old fart who keeps it moving. <laughs> <laughs> so since the way they chose it happened to fall roughly in chronological order, David will go first, and uh, since he chose one of Francis's early films as influential, so he'll go first. So David, would you like to introduce your clips, which we'll watch, and then start our first discussion? Um, are they going to play back to back? They're yeah, go they boom, are. Boom, yeah. Boom. Okay. So um, the first you have creative control. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go back. <laughs> I, I think the guild might have creative control. <laughs> so the first clip is from a, a picture called You're a Big Boy Now, which um, I thought was your first picture, but I understand that there's a, uh, a, an X-rated picture that may precede that. Is that <laughs> no? It's not true. I was, uh, I had, uh, was working as a kind of uh, editor on some uh, what were known as um, uh, nudie films in those days. <laughs> but, but the real... They were made out of different films, and the director was in Germany and stuff. And I didn't honestly ever believe, and I say this sincerely, that I was ever going to see my name on the screen because it seemed so uh, magical to see directed by someone. So I just put directed by Francis Coppola, and I put music by Carmine Coppola because I wanted to see my father get it credited. And for that. No one was there to argue, and, but I've had to live that. I've had to live that down ever since. But, I was like the third editor. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the name of that picture? Uh, it was a German black and white picture called Sin Started with Eve that someone <laughs> bought and wanted to insert uh, six minutes of nudie, 3D nudie fit, footage, which was my job to do. And the other one was a Western uh, nudie film called The Wide Open Spaces. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I had made a little uh, a nudie short, and I, and I was, they, they bought it, you know, for $600 or whatever, and they hired me to cut it into it, and that became known as the bellboy and the playgirls. And those, the, that was my nudie experience. So good. I wish we were showing that today. <laughs> Well, the funny thing of it was I used to mix them at the UCLA, one room that UCLA had to have a little mixing room. And on the Sunday that I was doing it, very, very, uh, you know, I had the keys, but uh, the dean was showing some <laughs> benefactors to donate money to UCLA. And the next day, there was a big sign, no unauthorized projects. <laughs> so good. <laughs> uh, so the first film, You're a Big Boy Now, now I realize in retrospect actually shows some of the influence of these earlier works. <laughs> uh, because, and, and I think it was happening at the advent of the sexual revolution, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. What, what, what year was You're a Big Boy Now? Um, like Mid-60s, it seems like. Yes, yeah, You're a Big Boy Now, yeah. It was my thesis film for UCLA. I wanted to make a full-length film as a thesis, and that was it. Well, what really s shocked me about it when I saw it about 10 or 11 years ago and discovered it for the first time was um, to see, you know, knowing all of your other work, I, I was so surprised to see this film that was so different in so many ways and had almost, uh, it's just, it felt like an independent film. It felt, there were parts of it that felt to me like a, like a Spike Jones film. Um, and, and it was filled with really cool experimental things. And... Um, so to me, it was really inspiring because I just saw how many different directions you had gone and how many different uh, plays you had in your book. I kind of feel like we talked about your student film, sort of. I mean, we can work our way backwards to it because I have a million questions for you about that, but I kind of want to start where we with the Godfather pictures, which they're just so... I learned so much every time I watch them, you know, and it's such a wonderful thing. It's like a singing a song. That it's just it's, it's always there. It's one of the best things that art can do for anybody. You get into the matrix of that thing when you watch it and you feel that, those feelings and the discipline and the preciseness of the work can organize your soul. You know, no matter where you are before you watch that, once you watch that, you're in the grid of that, and it's a, and it's a calming thing. It's almost like uh, taking a drug or something, a good drug a drug that helps you or heals you a little bit. That's how good art is. That's what I feel about good art, you know? And bad art can have the opposite effect, you know? Um, 
So those two, <laughs> those two scenes are so amazing. I mean, they're both interestingly, I think I don't even think I was conscious of picking this. They're both about young men finding guns. And in this first one, it's Michael, who's the baby, in the second one, who finds a gun as his father did in the second one. I'll just say a couple more things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll want to hear everything you have to say. I mean, your choices are so confident and so precise, as are those of the actors. You know, um, it's just so inspiring to me. For what comes to mind is the fact that we know it's like a ticking time bomb in each one, and you know, and, you, and you're just waiting. And you, there's no, almost no language, and I love that you chose not to have subtitles in the first one until Michael has to break that. I love that family's at the core of it. They're both on missions for their family because heart and soul to me is everything and family goes to right and heart and soul. In every picture you gotta have heart and soul or I don't care as much. Um, I love the shot in the bathroom of Michael over his back having that moment to himself before he goes. It's over two doors of the stalls and you barely catch a piece of the back of his head. That's just a such an inspired genius shot and so economical and you feel his entire emotion from seeing this much of the top of his head when he just puts his hands on the top of his head and in the second one you know just De Niro moving across the roofs in, in parallel to the other gentleman uh, and, and I, I just were you conscious of, of that this man was finding a gun as Michael had found a gun in the first one or was that just kismet? You know I, I had always felt that the the Godfather was a one-off film. I didn't, I didn't think there should be a second film and, and, and not a series. But of course, this is something that has happened to the film industry that uh, they, they want to own some kind of trademark and then see what they can get out of it. So I was very reluctant to do a second film. But I'd always thought it would be interesting to do a story about a man and his son at the same age, you know, say 30 years old, and how... Uh, how a parallel story might work. And so when they seemed to be so uh, serious about doing another Godfather film, I thought, well, let me take this as a subsidy and I'll do that idea. And, and uh, so yes, I, 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 I was interested in, in, in their parallel uh, lives. And, and you know, like oddly enough that the father had, Vito had done that murder so his son would never have to. And of course we know because it was the second film that the son had to. And so then you ask, if, are these things that happen in families, are they uh, passed on? I mean, if your uncle had a feud with his brother, does that mean you have to have a feud with your brother and that your kids have, you know, what's passed on aside from uh, the various gifts and genetic gifts, uh, uh, is sin passed on, you know? And, and, and uh, uh, so I was, Aware, and I, you know, I was very anxious that the audience know that the baby he was holding was Michael. But directors always, writer, directors, film people always have the problems. How do you get them to know? And, and inevitably, often you have to say it. And my friend Bob Town always told me that the the best line I ever wrote was, uh, "Michael, your father loves you." And I said, "Well, I don't get that. That's not such a." I was just doing it so they'd know the baby was. Michael, <laughs> but as I see it here, I, maybe for the first time I understood what Bob meant was that it was all done for his son and, and there's something sad because we kn know that the son uh, did get into the family business. Um, uh, but you know, when you talk about the Godfather, you're talking about the unique uh, uh, situation where you have a legendary great photographer. I mean, not at the time we chose those people, they weren't, but when you think back, we had this great photographer and this great production designer and these remarkable actors and, and uh, Nino Rota. And in the case of the last scene, that uh, funeral march that you heard, dun, 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 that was all written by my father. So going back to the nudie film when I put music by, <laughs> this was the, Thing. So, so I mean, uh, occasionally, don't don't disregard the element of luck in ma movie making because to have that cast, to have uh, Mario Puzo, who was the most wonderful, helpful man, uh, had written that book. But even uh, beyond in the collaboration and friendship, he he was just a just the greatest uh, possible person to work with. And then. Uh, all of those talented, um, you know, film is an ensemble. You're not, it's not like uh, you're, you're sort of the ringleader, 
but you, you, all, all of this work is coming out of uh, these people you work with and hopefully not only do you, that you inspire, but who inspired you to, to keep uh, looking uh, uh, for more. So The Godfather was certainly one of those uh, happy accidents that it all kind of did fall together. There were some interesting things in it. In the first scene, uh, in the movie, uh, Clemenza, who, uh, um, Richard Castellano, who teaches him, you know, because he's, he's just a, well, he was a Marine, of course, but he, he wasn't a gangster, and uh, he's taught, coached very carefully what to do. And uh, one of the things that he says is that when you come out of the bathroom, don't fool around, come out firing. So I was, of course, interested in how can I make this suspenseful. And first, when he's reaching behind the bathroom, at, and that one take, there was no gun there. I, I did that to, to Al. So he, <laughs> imagine, you know, you're going to do this. And the other thing, the other thing is uh, he comes out, he doesn't come out firing. So I had hoped the audience was saying, you're supposed to come out firing, you're supposed to come out firing. And, and uh, instead, he sits down, and you say he's going to blow it with that um, shot where you see so much life going on in Al. And of course, Walter Murch, who, who uh, was on the, on, the, on the sound part of the first Godfather, did the um, elevator train getting louder and louder. And then finally, he shoots them. And um, then when he leaves, he says, get rid of the gun right away. And he starts to walk out, and he doesn't get rid of the gun. And in the last second, he flips it. So I was, you know, it's, it's that thing of telling them what's going to happen and then playing with the fact that it doesn't happen in, in, that, uh, in, that, in that part. And that's, of course, missing in the scene. But it was, uh, you know, those, it, it, when you give someone instructions and then they don't follow it, that makes everyone very, very uh, nervous. Of course, the... The other scene in the, in the uh, San Gennaro Festival, I mean, it's just, as a kid, I used to love those festas, and my father would take us, and the pageantry, and of course, that was in the period when, when those, they still have the festa, but now they're selling ter teriyaki and, uh, you know, Corolos or whatever, and, and, but in those days, the festa was the big thing, so it was a joy to be able to uh, have the uh, the ability, the production, the money to be able to take that street and, and do that and, and the extraordinary work of uh, Dean Tavalaris and his team so uh, to, 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 uh, to portray that festa. Uh, and the music was a big part of it. Interestingly about uh, the first scene, you know, there's a lot of talk about, oh, the trouble on the Godfather. And it was true. And we could talk about that because that's an interesting subject to me. Uh, uh, what well, was true that you know the, the the idea of doing the Godfather this way, doing it period, uh, set in the 40s, the first Godfather, that cast was uh, the studio did not uh, did not embrace that. In fact, the then head of uh, Paramount, uh, the company that owned it was uh, Gulf and Western, and it was a remarkable guy named Charlie. Have, have you heard of Charlie Bluehorn? I do a good imitation of Charlie Bluehorn. <laughs> he was from Vienna, but he had this uh, uh, accent. And, you know, they, they were getting very scared about the choice uh, that they had made. I was young, and they, and they hired me for two reasons. Number one, there weren't a lot of young directors around. There was this idea that young directors, you know, would use new light handheld cameras and make films cheap. And, and, and also, I had started working as a screenwriter, and I had uh, some success as a, you know, I was in my 20s. And then also, um, I was Italian-American, so they figured, you know, the Godfather, the case there's any flack for uh, this, at least we have an Italian, we could say, oh, he's Italian, you know? <laughs> so that's how I got the job. And, and the fact that everyone had turned it down. I mean, wonderful directors turned it down, I think, Costa Gavras turned it down. Kazan turned it down. I think, um, I think, what's his name turned it down? Uh, it'll come to me. But so <coughs> it was only after that the book continued to be a big bestseller and the project began to be more important. But their idea was to do it cheap with this uh, young director who could, like, script was sort of in trouble when I came on it because it had been written to be a contemporary story. So it had hippies in it. <laughs> it was in, set in the 70s. 
Uh, and that was all just economics, of course. And they were going to shoot it in Kansas City because <laughs> New York was considered very, you know, uh, they wanted to shoot it in Kansas City. <laughs> so I became unpopular right on because I wanted to make it period and I wanted to shoot it in New York. And, and the budget was two hundred, two and a half million dollars for the golf, the first, but the first budget. <laughs> and um, and uh, so, so uh, needless to say, I was in big trouble every week and I was going to get fired. And it's true. But what's not true is that then uh, I'm, I'm told by people that into the picture later on they saw this scene, the one with Michael, and they were very unsure of Al. They had seen him finally, what finally pushed them into, because he, they had said, no, 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 and uh, we shot screen tests of absolutely everybody, and they said, no, no, no. And finally, uh, Bob Evans uh, saw um, Panic in Needle Park, or a rough cut of it, and he saw something in, uh, of Al in that, that finally made him uh, relinquish. But they were very, very not happy with the cast. In fact, I did all these screen tests, and Charlie Bluthorn, who was very active, saw them all, and he said, these actors, they're all terrible. Every actor I've seen is terrible. How is it possible that every actor in Hollywood is terrible? No, they're not terrible. It's the director that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and that was sort of the mood of it. And, and, <laughs> and, and then finally, this scene was what, what prevented me from getting fired. But what the truth is, is this scene was the third day of the shoot. In other words, the very first day, day one of the first week was uh, uh, Al and Dan Keaton buying presents. And, and the second day was uh, 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 Bobby Duval getting toys and a sled and some stuff. But the, that week, the, the Wednesday and Thursday was the scene. It was two days. So this idea that that was, you know, uh, that this scene that has so solidified my employment happened later and they were, it's not true, it was the first week, they didn't, they, you know, it wasn't, it didn't save me, they were still firing me the third week and this, had already, <laughs> and this scene had already existed. And then the Friday was the scene where we were at the, the hospital when Sterling Hayden punches him and Al slipped on the running board and they twisted his ankle so we couldn't shoot anymore, and they took him away, and so I had lost the day, and I was in big trouble for having lost half a day. Uh, so that was the first week of, of the Godfather, <laughs> but this scene was already done. I've thought a lot about this subject of, uh, you know, a lot of my films, uh, most of my films and the successful, they weren't like such big hits in their time. They were very controversial. Not so much The Godfather, because The Godfather really had this wonderful cast, and, and, and it, wa it was a big success. It was the only success like that I can remember. The rest were very shifty and shaky and <laughs> apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> I, read recently, I read recently that this uh, writer named Frank Rich left the New York Times, and everyone was saying, oh, he's such a wonderful. I said, yeah, Frank Rich. I said, he's the one who said that apocalypse now was the major disaster in 50 years of Hollywood history <laughs> on, 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 when the film came out. That was his, his review. And I kept saying, gee, you know, wasn't there something else that was bad too? <laughs> <laughs> was Apocalypse really the worst film? I mean, could it be just one of the low 10? <laughs> so, so, so a lot of these movies that later on gain, gain respect uh, are, are, are don't get it at first. And, and I was thinking about this recently. I, I recently saw a picture called Snake Pit with Olivia de Havilland. It was about a, uh, I think it was a big success in its day. I remember her, her performance. I, I always loved Olivia de Havilland. But, uh, and so I, I wanted to see it for, for various reasons. And I watched it, you know, it was, uh, y you know how when you see a movie that was thought of very well in his time, but when you, there are many that don't feel this way, but that one just felt very old-fashioned and dated and the kind of acting and the thing. And then you wonder, um, gee, if some of those movies in those days that were lauded and considered wonderful films, now we view as sort of dated and, and old-fashioned, that's, that's because there are these other movies that come along that everyone reacts to negatively, but slowly 
over time they embrace them and it sort of takes the audience step by step to a point where then when they go, if, if you go back and you look at some of, you know, classic war films or not the great ones because the great ones are immune from being old fashioned, you know. But there is a process I think that happens where the new work, the, 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 the work that isn't embraced right away, that no one likes. I read recently um, that, uh, what was it, the, what was the Lawton film, the great Lawton film, uh, Night of the Hunter. Mm. That was a terribly, no one liked it and it barely got released and everything. And yet we look at it and see it today and we're really impressed with it, you know. So there is this journey that happens with art that, uh, that, that these chances you take and, and are maybe sometimes unpopular, sometimes you fail uh, or, and later on they look at it as with Lawton didn't even know how much his film, he, didn't, he never got to direct another film for, because of that and we look at it now and think how beautifully he made it. So, so that if you're gonna be out there on the edge of things, you gotta be prepared that you're not gonna have the, the success in your time. Or if you're lucky, 15 years later, they look at it and, uh, and speak well of it. But, but there is definitely this process and, and those films that go against the norm or try to fight for something, even without the filmmaker necessarily knowing what, he, what they're doing. Did you know what you were doing when you made Punch Drunk Glove? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just trying to get through every day, and it started to feel it's um, horrible. I mean, it was horrible for the first three weeks. It just felt terrible. Like I didn't know. It, none of it looked good. None of it looked right. And stopped and started again. And and then um, f somewhere along the way, everything started to feel better, and it felt better. And then. And do you notice as years go by, people say, "Oh, I love that. That was so beautiful. Or that was so unique." Yeah. No. And I thought. I thought. I. I, I and then it turned out that everything I thought was terrible was was really good. Well, just with some distance, and it felt good. And then I edited it together, and I thought. I think I made a film that every single person is going to see and is going to make like five hundred billion dollars. You know, <laughs> I finally did it, and and no one saw it, and but people really like it. But I, I mention it because each of these uh, wonderful directors each has made a film, if not more than one. That's one of my favorites, and Punch, Lug Punch Drunk Glove, uh, not to mention uh, the others, and certainly Boogie Nights. But Punch, Drunk, I always loved because I when I go to the movies, I have to go out and say. I never saw anything like that. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite thing to say, you know. And, and that leaves you, that filmmaker, in a tough spot for a while. <laughs> you know, unless then finally, it tends to come around though, mm -hmm. eventually. And these, these, uh, these movies that are, are so tough uh, over time. And then the other films seem old fashioned because you know, we always talk about art in general. I mean, you know, the, the, the avant-garde art of today becomes the, the, the chair upholstery and wallpaper of tomorrow <laughs> because the, the, it changes the way people look at things and it happens so much with films. Is that what you felt when you saw you're a big boy now? That this was something that... No, you're a big resonated. boy now. I was in love, as we all were, with uh, Richard Lester. We loved Richard Lester. We just thought he was so neat and... And not just the Beatles film, which were pretty terrific, but uh, the Knack, and 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 just Richard Lester. And he, and he, by the way, he is a he's alive. He's a wonderful man. And and if you go to England, you can go to Twickenham Studio, and the odds are he'll he'll chat with you if you if you. Uh, he's a very very nice man. But at any rate, he was the. Uh, I was so impressed with some of those British films. Although he's an American, as you probably know, and. Um, uh, and even films like Morgan or uh, there were other loneliness of the long distance runner. So that was uh, me as a, I was a UCLA student when pretty much I made that film, You're a Big Boy Now. And I just wanted to make a Richard Lester film and I wanted to, uh, uh, it had one of the early rock and roll scores. It had uh, Love and Spoonful. We just talk about your dad really quickly because it was on The Godfather and you mentioned him. Mm -hmm. um, how, how that collaboration might work or... Uh, My dad was a um, very, of course, anyone who's lived in the household with a, a, a man who is frustrated in his work and feels that he's not being uh, able to have the opportunities or, or... And my father, I felt, was you know, such an, a, a talented man, but he was a great 
a flutist. And so he was, I mean, a classical flutist. Uh, I say flutist because that's what he did. Uh, there is flautist. I asked him once, of course, what's the difference between a flutist and a flautist? He said, $50 a week. <laughs> But he, uh, he was a very important <laughs> figure in our, our lives <clears throat> and his career. Uh, he was the solo flute for the NBC Symphony with Arturo Toscanini. Mm. And when he left that, his career just went slowly down all through all of the kids. My sister's here, Tally, and, and she probably got the worst of it because he really got depressed. And when I was going to do The Godfather, he hatched this idea with my mother. <coughs> that he would go along and they paid their own way and they just showed up and he he said listen I can write you know when there's the wedding and you need a little six piece combo I'll write all that stuff and uh, he knew about publishing <laughs> 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 he knew about because my mother's uh, my mother's father was a publisher and a, a musician so he just uh, they were like this funny couple uh, there, paying their own way, they were not officially, but when we did the wedding, he organized and wrote all that music, all that da 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 all the tarantellas and things, and um, just sort of snuck it in, and, I, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, when the film turned out to all come together and be successful, uh, he had all that music in it, and that sort of helped start him. And then on the second one, Nino Rota, who was this wonderful Italian composer who we all know from the, um, the Fellini pictures, but he also did a, a lot of the Visconti picture. And the picture that, that he did that, made, that I loved and made me think he would be right for the Godfather was Rocco and his brothers. So that was what I wanted uh, for the Godfather. Although, again, when we went and recorded the, that, uh, because uh, the studio had other ideas of who should write the music. They hated the music. Uh, they wanted it out. They wanted to have a new score. And I said, well, I, I don't know why I said this, because I don't think it has any legal basis at all, but I said it. I said, well, if you want to have it out, I won't take it out, so you have to fire me and hire a director who will take it out. I just said that very <laughs> like DGA. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, for a week, for a week, we had a stalemate. We would go up to the house of the, you know, the, uh, the head guy and um, and uh, Walter Merch and I would go and sit and wait, waiting for a breakthrough. The funny thing with The Godfather is that it had never really been seen. Uh, 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 Bob Evans, you know, I felt he had a lot at stake with it. It was very, you know, we think of the studios as being so powerful and rich and stuff, but there were some shaky days in the early period of Paramount. They really, uh, it was very important picture to them as because the book had become so big, but uh, it had never been seen. And, and we were all very nervous about it. I remember uh, one night um, in the editing room, the French Connection came out and it was, it was, everyone was talking about it. It was, you know, exciting and riveting and, and just everyone is talking about it. And, you know, there's a, a kind of code of honor in editing rooms, the assistant editor stuff, don't ever venture a comment about your picture. I guess they say don't ever, you know. <laughs> so uh, I remember with one of the assistant editors, young guy, uh, Prentice, he, he rode a bike. He was a nice young man and, and he was walking with me in Beverly Hills. I was sleeping in Jimmy Kahn's maid's room because I had no money, I had three kids, and I was using the per diem to send it home to be the money and, uh, and living in this little room in the, the maid's room. So he walked me home, and as we were walking, I said to him, I said, wow, the French Canadian is really great. Isn't it? And he says, yeah, it's fantastic. He says, it's just so exciting. I said, well, I guess compared to that, Godfather is just going to be a dark, slow, boring movie. And he said, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> So typical. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I went into the little maid's room. It was a size. Of, <laughs> and you know, I really, really thought it was uh, uh, curtains. Yeah, right. It's mm -hmm. horrible. Oh. I, I, I like to joke that Mephistopheles came out of the bushes. <laughs> I said, how would you like it to be the very successful, yeah. biggest movie? And then some transaction was made. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we move on? I want to 
to say one thing about You're a Big Boy Now is that actress, Elizabeth Hartman, I don't know if you remember her from... Patch uh, of Blue. Patch of Blue. She Nominated most, for an, an Oscar. She was the most wonderful uh, young actress and uh, a lovely, lovely person. I'll never forget her. And, uh, you know, she never, she thought she was homely. So when I, I have this weird thing of sometimes I cast them parts wrong deliberately. And I had Karen Black, who was just, you know, very pretty, sexy girl, and, the, and, and uh, Elizabeth Hartman, who was just painfully shy. And uh, I, of course, I, I cast the sexy one as Elizabeth Hartman and the painfully shy one as Karen Black. And uh, I remember when I called up uh, to, to the first phone call to, uh, she had accepted to do it, and she said, but have you seen me? <laughs> because, uh, but she was, she was beautiful, more than beautiful in a way. We've lost, we lost uh, that cast, except uh, Peter Kastner is gone, and, uh, mm -hmm. and this remarkable Elizabeth Hartman. Did you know of her from before? No. Yeah, she was really a wonderful actress, I think, and she died young, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I just want to mention her to okay. everybody. I want to ask about Walter Murch because he's so fascinating. Can you just talk about that relationship? It sounds so important. And well, Walter is, you know, film's real intellectual. You know, he's just an amazing uh, person with a fantastic mind, interested in all kinds of things other than filmmaking, the alignment of theories of planetary alignment and all kinds of totally interesting stuff. He's a brilliant person. And he was one of um, the group from USC uh, who were friends of, of George Lucas. We, you know, there was UCLA and USC, uh, two film schools here in California. I was from UCLA, and I was about three years older than everyone. So when I made You're a Big Boy Now, that was big news because no student had ever made a full-length film as a thesis or, or e even a full-length film. When I say, you know, I put my name on the nudie films, it was you didn't feel possible that you were really going to be able to have a, a career. A lot of film students went and made uh, USIA films for the, for, for the government or documentary uh, film at that level. And uh, it didn't seem possible to be. Um, but this group of young guys from UC, USC, we all went, George had come from Modesto. And I thought it would be appealing to be you know, I've always wanted to be an artist, but a bohemian artist, you know, and sit in cafes and <laughs> that type of uh, life as I imagined it to be. And so we all moved to San Francisco, and uh, the, they, Walter uh, drove the truck with the equipment that we had, and, and uh, we, we sort of moved en masse as maybe seven, eight uh, guys. It was all guys in those days. In fact, in the UCLA Film School, there was only one girl in the whole, uh, in the whole student body. Very nice girl, Melanie Finkel Finkelstein. <laughs> Extremely nice. I'm, but she was the only girl registered in, in, the, in the school. At any rate, uh, Walter was a, kind of Gerald McBoing Boing. He was the one <laughs> of the group that was known for his uh, imaginative use of sound. And he was like that. He, he spoke almost like uh, in sound and everything. And so uh, he was involved on, on the early films, The Rain People, uh, George's uh, THX 38, which had a very complex sound uh, uh, job. But, but I had this idea when I did the conversation because it was also uh, about sound, and I wanted Walter to do it, but I said, well, Walter, why don't you be the editor too? And he said, well, I've never, I don't, I've never edited a picture. I said, well, you could probably do it. And so, <laughs> so Walter was, along with a fellow named Richard Chu, who was also a picture editor, Walter edited the, uh, the film, the picture, and did the sound, and then was involved in all of these films, um, the Godfather films, mainly on sound on the first one, and then on the second one, he was actually a picture editor, too. And, you know, he's a filmmaker in his own right, made a, made a film called Return to... Oz that was extremely unusual, maybe too unusual for what they had wanted. So he, he, uh, he had a tough time on that. And, um, and uh, you know him now as the master editor. But he's a fantastic theorist. He's written several books. And he's just an extraordinary person. Again, it's that thing like with The Godfather. Is that the director works with the team. And, 
And of course, you have to have some ability to pick the right people. Uh, but I've been blessed uh, throughout my career with some uh, really wonderful people in all those uh, areas. And Walter is certainly one of my, one of my longest. Sure. Can we have a look at some more film? Absolutely. Let's look at Apocalypse, then you can right. leave Whatever you want. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, <laughs> run uh, up some bits of Apocalypse. Yeah. Did Walter cut that? Uh, Apocalypse was uh, it's a long story, but Apocalypse, there were three editors. Nice. There was uh, Walter Ritchie, Marx, and uh, uh, Gerald uh, Greenberg, and, uh, and Lisa. There was a, a team. It was a, that was a tough go. For me, you know, a daunting task to pick a few clips from Apocalypse Now. My first um, cut down version was like two hours and ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I see why it was such a difficult task to edit this. And I just went all the dazzling, beautiful scenes that we love so much. And then I just went, I was struck so much, and I picked these for character, just for that deep laser exploration of character. And, you know, that's. Um, amazing. <laughs> you know, what? Interesting about uh, talking about Walter Murch because Walter Murch really edited that first scene, his own style with the helicopter and <clears throat> the scene where he uh, punches the mirror. But also, it was Walter's idea that we add to the script. It wasn't in it a kind of Miley massacre. And uh, I thought about it. I'm going back. He uh, he was not there, he was in California and we had come back and he told me, you know what, what you need is a massacre scene and so I cooked up the, uh, the puppy sampan as it became known. That was so, of those two things, they're very much uh, uh, related to Walter. Mm. Well, I was, um, you know, we, you talked earlier about rehearsal and um, of course on the beautiful documentary how how was it to get Martin Sheen to feel comfortable to do that scene or Well, you know, it's an interesting uh, point because in the, in the script, Apocalypse Now was written by John Melius, and much of what the character had to do was look at weird things. I mean, it was, there's always a shot of a face and he's looking at whatever it may be, but it was, it was a very passive kind of a role, and I, I really worried about that. That's one of the reasons why I wanted I'm already sheen to it because he has such a beautiful face. I think, well, if you're going to look at this this fellow, you know, he ought to look nice. But uh, I thought, I, I wish there was one scene at the beginning that established that he was a complex, deep guy. So the audience, and, and audiences will do this, will, would read into, if he's looking at something interesting, that they would read emotion or thoughts in the character that's really, he's just looking, he's very p passive. So I thought um, if I could do something at the beginning that set that up, and I had a dream. Sometimes dreams give you good solutions, because I think when you're worrying about something or you can't arrive at it, you kind of let your subconscious work on it, and it'll, it'll, it, it works even when you think you're not working. And in the dream, it came to me that Marty was vain. Not, not that he is, but that if I could taunt him on the fact that he was vain. So in that scene, I told him to go to the mirror, and uh, he went to the mirror, and I was talking the whole time, and I was saying, look how beautiful your face is. Look at your mouth. Look, you really, and, and I kind of goaded him <laughs> on, his, on a, a vanity that, that I just assumed was there, I, I, because he's the sweetest person on earth. He's such a gentleman. He's such a good person, good father, good husband. Uh, but I just thought maybe there was some little flaw in him, you know, that was that. <laughs> yeah. So I goaded him on it, and finally he just lashed out and punched his face. And that was what made the hand bleed. That wasn't intended to be. I mean, that's real. That's his blood that he wipes off. And I'm sitting, I was sitting on a dresser up high, and thinking, my God, what, if I say cut because he's bleeding, uh, it, he, he could hate me because he's gone through all this to get this thing. So I didn't say cut, and so everybody else was mad. I mean, how could you just let him, you know, bl bleed on the set? But but that was the purpose was to try to get something memorable that then would um, w would make make the, be in the audience's mind. Oh, he's a complicated guy, you know, from that opening sequence that that you chose. That was the reason why I did it because there isn't. 
a kind of personal scene anywhere else in the film to get at what he feels like or what his feelings are. Can you talk about the narration? Help. That's Michael Hare, a uh, wonderful writer. Was uh, He wrote Dispatches, and uh, that's all his... Um, again, it's these other people you work with that you get lucky with. But you read the book, and you read his articles, and, and yeah, I, brought him into it. I, I yeah. chose him, yes. I, I can, I can lay claim to that, but he wrote it. But um, I wonder, you know, did you alter the picture as, the dial as his narration... No. Formed or no, he wrote it that uh, to the cut uh, later on mm -hmm. when we when we were um, we had a narration, and, but none of us had really been to Vietnam, really, you know. So, so uh, he had been there. So later we had the idea to choose him to to write it, but the film was already cut. Mm -hmm. So you went into it not knowing that you would have a voiceover, or you... There was a voiceover in the original Melia script, but it wasn't that what voiceover. It was, uh, uh, it was uh, less... Um, that, that Michael Hare actually having written Dispatches, which is that, you right. know, and he was there for so many... Uh, he was there a long time, so he really had it down, and he did a beautiful job. That so you knew it, it wasn't feeling right what Milius had read and decided to find Michael We decided Hare. to get a, 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 a voiceover that would would nail it. You know, that's one of the great luxuries of filmmaking in the post-production thing, especially with sound and ADR and voiceover. You can, you can try things. You know, it's, right. not, it's not so dire to do a narration and, and record it and then throw it out. Often in narrations or things, you might do it five, six times and the actor will come up and, and give you another version. The interesting thing about the story of the, um, uh, the, the, the polio arms is that was spread out over a longer, uh, the way I worked with Brando was sort of, uh, it was funny because we only had three weeks with him. And uh, the first week he shows up, but of course he's really big. And the, you, you run into the problem right away. I said, well, what kind of costume am I going to get for him? I mean, I can't get a super <laughs> 4X Green Beret combat. <laughs> you know, they don't make that. So, you know, how should I... How should I do it? So when I said to him, well, what if, like, you kind of, he's gone because he's up there operating in the hinterlands. What if he's, like, gone into just he's got a mango in his hand and a cute Montagnard girl and he's just this enormous fat guy? And <coughs> fat people, uh, I can tell you, are, 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 uh, don't want to be fat. You know, they hate it, and he hated it, anyone really struggles with that. So he's, no, 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 I can't, I can't do that. So I said, well, I can't put him in a Green Beret uniform. And he doesn't want to be shown as though he's gone to seed or he's gotten big. So um, what can I do? And, and then I said, well, what about if we shave off your head and you'd be like the Kurtz in, in, um, in the Conrad uh, book? And he's, no, 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 that won't work. So I said, okay, so I can't get a uniform, I can't. <laughs> so I thought what I could do maybe is like dress them in like black pajamas and, you know, when you photograph someone, if they're big, if they have broad, you know, because they're broad-shouldered or, or even if they're fat, that dimension, if you then get a double who's like six foot five, then it would maybe portray him as a giant. <laughs> so I decided to go that way. So he arrived, and he, in, the, in Apocalypse, we didn't have trailers. They were like a houseboat he had. And we'd go in the houseboat and start talking, and I just, uh, he's a very... Brando was like a very brilliant guy. He could talk about termites for seven hours, and <laughs> it would be really interesting. So that's the first day. That's what he did. He talked about termites, and there'd be a knock on, knock on the door. Say, okay, uh, what should we do? Should we let the crew break for lunch? I say, yeah, and then we'd talk more and more and more and more. And then the knock on the door. He said, well, what should we do? Maybe we just go home. I said, yeah. And so for four days, that's and I only had three weeks. So for four days that he just, just was talking about stuff and everything, and I would try to get things in, and, and I, but I was recording uh, what he was saying, and he would go on these incredible riffs, and uh, finally on the fifth day or whatever it was, uh, he, he shows up and he's bald. And I looked and I was startled because that's the Kurtz look from the Heart, from the, uh, heart of Darkness. And I said, but you, you said it wouldn't work. You said you read Heart of Darkness in a work. He said, I lied. I never read it. I read it last night. <laughs> so, so he did it. But that, so that scene was, 
derived at what we would do is we would do these kind of improvisations and I would take it home and try to write something and and then he would even um, uh, then read, uh, he didn't like to memorize lines, so he'd read it and he had a little thing in his ear with a tape recorder so he could trigger what he had said before and, and get the lines that way, you know. So, but that scene was very long, but fortunately Vittorio had this, uh, this shadow going back and forth. And it was the first scene I really cut electronically, going back to when that was. And what I did is I sort of cobbled that whole thing that he said, but it was made out of lots of pieces. And then whenever there was the cut, the shadow went and hit it. So it was made out of a much longer thing. Those are some little stories I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the word genius is tossed around, you know. I think in my life, and I met some great people, but I don't know that I've met five genii or whatever you call them. But <laughs> Orson Welles was one, I mean, uh, Orson Welles also, who, but uh, Marlon Brando was one. And not just be as an actor, just as a mind, the, w the way he saw things and the way he talked. I really think he was a unique, uniquely uh, brilliant man. I mean, did you, did you rehearse him and stuff like that, or did you just let him run? Well, we didn't know what to do because we had only like two, a couple of weeks left with him, and I knew he was going to, it was $3 million for three weeks, and I knew what he was doing is he was going to get to the end of the third week and go unless I gave him another $3 million. So at one point, Vic, uh, Victorio Storaro said, you know, let's, once he cut his hair off, then I had something like, I now knew what he would look like, and he said, Francis, don't worry, we go step by step. And we took him up <laughs> in the thing. And Marlon was always interesting. He always wanted to know, you know, like what the shot was. He'd always go like this. He'd see you and he'd go. <laughs> and then he'd proceed <laughs> to act with the part that was going to be in the picture. <laughs> and so when he saw that we just had the shadow, he decided that, you know, <laughs> that that character had to be dished out in razor slices. So he just kind of was in the dark and you're like, poked his all that, <laughs> and poked a little bit of his nose in, and, he, and, and Brando did that uh, out of just the light and dark. And we just sort of started, uh, just to start, you know, because it had been four days in the boat doing nothing. <laughs> and were there some <laughs> studio people back in Hollywood looking at this stuff, having a fit? Well, I was, I was on the hook. I financed it. Oh, my God. I financed I put everything up. So there, was no, there were no studio people. Um, just, um, yeah. <laughs> El Eleanor, what did it feel like to know that it could? <laughs> she was very brave. But will you talk about the presentation of that movie? Because I remember being a kid and seeing an ad in the LA Times that you must have taken out to see the film before it came out in Westwood. Mm. Oh, well, that was sort of a, a preview. It was like a... We were hoping to, to um, uh, you know, to survive. Uh, you know, we, uh, it, it was very... Generate interest or to get ideas... I, I was in... It was in the Village Theater, I think, one of That's those right. nice theaters. I, I don't remember exactly why we did the preview, but it was like a preview. I think we were showing it to some important people and... The, the screening I remember of Apocalypse, Apocalypse originally was like what they called Apocalypse Redux. It was that. The, the Apocalypse, the Redux version is just the original version. And we showed it to some Japanese distributors. I was on the hook for it, but I had international, like I had sold it to Japan, I had sold it to France. So we showed it to the Japanese distributors and we had sold it as though, firstly, it was gonna have Steve McQueen and be like a bridge too far. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and McQueen, uh, unfortunately, was very ill, and so uh, ultimately he had to drop out because it was an arduous uh, trip to go there. But he was very into it, McQueen, I, I remember. So, so we then got these distributors to give us the money, and the Japanese distributors came to see the version in the North Point Theater in San Francisco, and it was longer. I mean, uh, Apocalypse, the redux is like a half an hour longer, so it was a half an hour longer than what it was. And it was a disastrous screening. It, it was one of 
uh, one, of, one of the most disastrous, but I've had a lot of disasters. <laughs> so I, mean, I had all these nice crew people, all these editors, and they were all, so I remember very vividly what I did. I don't know why I did it, but I looked at them and I said, a good movie we haven't got, a good screenplay we haven't got, a good director we haven't got, what do we got? Bum, bum. We've got heart, miles and miles and miles. And the whole editing room is singing this heart song. And then, then we went in there and we cut the half an hour out. And, uh, you know, we had some other f very funny, disastrous stories, which I would be happy to share with you, but I don't want to overstay the schedule. <laughs> Dustin, I wanted to say, Dustin Hoffman told me that he was at that Westwood screening and he remembers talking to you. Um, do you remember talking to him? I, I don't remember that. I was petrified. I mean, it was t b b not only a, an immense artistic failure looming, but it was an even bigger financial disaster. He, he says, he, what he remembers is that he said to you that, um, he said he didn't know that people would get the picture, you know, by seeing it one time. And he, he recalls that you said, well, then, you know, why shouldn't people have to go see the picture twice to, uh, to get it? That's what he remembers. Is that what I said? That's what he <laughs> said. That's what he said. <laughs> it, it was pretty dismal. I mean, the apocalypse really was. But you got out of it. Didn't you get your money out of it? Well, that's a joke because, uh, yes, um, Apocalypse was a movie that didn't go away. It, it, it wasn't received well. and I mean, it got some nominations and, and what have you. But um, people just kept going back to the Pacific Dome Theater just to see it with that great soundtrack that it had, and, and it, just, it, it just didn't go away. So little by little, it, uh, it survived. And, um, but what had happened is I was sure that I was going to be just totally eaten up by it because it was everything we had on the line. So I said, well, I know what I'll do. Before we lose all that money, I'll make another m movie that will make a lot of money. It'll be a happy musical. <laughs> so. I made one from the heart. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened was the apocalypse now didn't sink the ship. It went on and got better and better. But one from the heart did sink the ship. <laughs> oh so very God. often the thing that you do as the remedy is worse than the poison it's trying. <laughs> now, now, Francis, you won an Oscar for writing Patton, didn't you? Yes. Yes. And then, and, and then how would you compare that to the writing experience of Apocalypse Now? I don't know, maybe there isn't a comparison. Well, 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 John Milius wrote Apocalypse Now. I mean, all the good stuff in it, all the lines that you all quote, and the helicopter battle playing bug, that's all John Milius. What I did is I put this strange beginning on it, and I really went on the set. I didn't have a script. I had a little notated um, Joseph Conrad with my pocket. And so I sort of took John's script and kept mating it with Conrad and inventing. The character that uh, Dennis Hopper played wasn't even in the script. I just made it up out of, uh, when I saw him, how wacky he was, I, I, made, you know, I made it out of a character that's in the Conrad. So, so the, the Patton uh, job, which was really a long time ago, I was a kid, I was you know, 25 or something when I did Patton. And that was, I was there at Fox for, you know, whatever, four or five months and really had a job and I wrote the script. So it was a real script. The, 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 the <laughs> apocalypse, I, my problem with apocalypse is I realized that I had m started to go on a route of making the movie more surreal and I had no ending because mm -hmm. the ending was very typical, you know, the, uh, the bridge, of, you know, a, a war movie ending, big battle and what have you. And I had no ending and I was very terrified about my situation. Mm -hmm. So let's look at some more film, Paul's choices. Could you introduce that? The conversation, um, I, I think the clip, clip speaks for itself. Um, I mean, I remember seeing it in a high school film class. It was the first time that I saw it with a great, great teacher who introduced us to it. Where was that, uh, Paul? Uh, in the Valley at a school oh, called Campbell Hall. Yeah, and um, the next, the second clip is from Youth Without Youth, um, which is your second to last movie, most recent movie, with Tim Roth speaking to himself 
um, which you do a lot for the movie, which kind of reminds me, uh, it, it, there's a sort of echoes of the scene with Martin Sheen and the narration uh, in Apocalypse Now, but um, I guess the questions that I have about it, that maybe you can talk about later, is, is, is the writing, because Youth Without Youth is based on a book, so that you sort of see this conversation, this dialogue happening, I wonder what it is in the book. Is it internal narration in the book, or how did you kind of come up with the topic? Well, Youth Without Youth is the work of uh, a, a man named Mircea Eliade, and he primarily was uh, 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 the, really the founder of uh, uh, the field of uh, comparative religion. He was uh, uh, has written many uh, works on, on uh, religion and, and comparative, comparing, uh, but he sort of had this other hobby of writing these kind of little uh, Borges type stories, you know, these little enigmatic stories. And Youth Without Youth was one of them. And I, I was stumped on a project called Megalopolis. I decided that I wasn't going to be a working director anymore uh, and that I would rather really have a period of my life where I could make personal films. But uh, Megalopolis was a big personal film. and. And uh, I had no idea where I'd ever get the money for it, and I had never licked the script properly. And it, it sort of dealt with the theme of utopia, and it was set in New York. And right while we were shooting some second unit for it is when the 9-11 attack happened. In fact, we have a footage. We, we shot three days after the attack, because it was so extraordinary, and we, we were able, it was so early, that we were able to get permission to go up in the, the uh, air and shoot the, the tower is still coming down and smoldering. I have that footage. But then I realized uh, that I was never going to maybe, especially with my story about utopia, the world was changing very rapidly, and I didn't know how to get I tried to write my way out of it, but I never could. And then I had a, a moment of, uh, you know, why don't, why don't I just make personal films, let them be modest budgets, inexpensive budgets, and, and to learn from my daughter, Sophia, who, who had learned, in a sense, from me in my early wonderful training with Roger Corman and how to make films cheap. And Sophia was making films, uh, you know, uh, of modest budgets, and I said I could just do that and make films that I would uh, finance myself. And I, I came upon this story of <coughs> Merce Eliade, and I just loved this story. I just thought it was so interesting. And uh, this scene uh, was, uh, by the way, a scene that I was under a lot of pressure from many of my own team to cut out because it was, you know, like philosophy. But I found it fascinating, this idea of uh, the, the duality of, you know, like uh, it's very Indian uh, philosophy of the unity of uh, opposites that really, in a way, all opposites go away depending on the vantage point you l look at. And I thought this scene in the book was fascinating, but it wasn't. It was. It was his internal. Uh, he was thinking these things about uh, uh, the, the unity of light and dark, of good and evil, the sameness of those things. And so I, um, uh, yeah, I, I when I wrote the script, I had imagined the idea of the double appearing and using the the mirror reflection, talking to him, and then photographing him, w one aspect of his personality looking down and the other aspect looking up. But, but I love that moment. When I, I really like this scene and, and the fact that he, he says, well, you know, empirical proofs in metaphysical discussions are really irrelevant. But anyway, he says, well, how do I know I'm, that I'm really talking to someone who is objective? And, and, the, and, the guy, and the other, the double says, well, you know, these proofs are irrelevant, but, but just for the hell of it, how would you like a flower put in your hand? You know, and he said, well, sure. And, and <laughs> so I, I, I find this uh, fascinating. This is Mircea uh, Eliade's work. And, uh, and I, I, I learned so much just sort of tagging along with the author, who's, of course, passed away, but learning from him. And, of course, the film was just didn't, you know, it, it's starting to happen now. Every once in a while, pe people say, oh, I saw Youth Without Youth. That was very interesting. And I, I wonder, you know, I'm a guy, we, we, it happens to all of us, I suppose, or many, who as they get older, especially if they're associated with some really big successes when they're young, they never can live, they can never, you know, you, you can never do it again, really, at that level. And um, so that there is, it's easy to get bitter when you're older and say, you know, they don't, you know, as many of the greats did, Tennessee Williams, Fellini, there's a whole, Norman Mailer, there's always that 
great hit when you're young or period when you're young that you, you, you feel you can't ever live up to. I tried another tack. I just said, well, I'll just re reinvent myself. I'll be a student filmmaker and I'll just make very, very inexpensive films. And, uh, and uh, by doing that, I, everything will be different, especially if you're used to doing a production like Godfather 2 where you have so much uh, ability through your budget to have the best of everything. So, uh, so I thought, well, you know, I'm, I think I was 68 or something, and I've always felt that a man's greatest life is his 50s. I unfortunately spent from 40 to 50 paying off one from the heart, so I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember from 40 to 50 too well, except I had to have a job every year. But my being 50 was wonderful, so I decided I was always going to be 50. So I was, uh, I was 50, 17 when I did it now. Now I'm, now I'm 50, 22. And then you just drop off like uh, uh, European currencies. When it gets too big, you just <laughs> drop off too. So I'm 22 as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, and you know, I, I have to say at this age, and I'm, I'm sure all of you have, have made such beautiful, each one of you has made one of my favorite films, which is why I wanted, and as I said before, more than one. But uh, that was, no matter how old you get, the cinema is just so totally magical. You're just constantly scratching your head and look, look, look how it behaves. You know, I take this piece from here and I put it over there and it changes absolutely everything. And then like it's made of organic material because it sort of just grows together and, and it becomes the new place becomes now really part of it, you know, like it was meant to be. And then if you break it again and put it somewhere else, it grows. So I, I, um, I am just continually amazed and fascinated, and many of my my con my contemporaries feel the same way. It's just a, just a magical work, and 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 that that's the pity of in the, the the present situation of when any kind of experimentation is so frowned upon, because it is the ex exper experimentation that created the the cinema in the twenties. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful quote of Marnau that I love. You know. You know, Marnell was really very respected as uh, it was brought to Hollywood and he made some gorgeous movies. And uh, when asked about sound, he said, well, he said, sound was inevitable. He says, but it came too soon. <laughs> because it was such a flowering of, 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 of what was being learned about what movies could be and how they behave and what the language is. And it's so young that, you know, of course that's going to go on for hundreds of years if just we can gain the ability to, um, to, to, to not, you know, have to do what exactly uh, makes the money right away the first year, you know. But uh, I'm, it's what I was saying about people my age, you know, you kind of can't live down some of the successes you had with Young, but I always remind people, I said, they weren't successes, they got slowly people started to like them better. So maybe some of the ones I'm doing now that are certainly not successes, maybe slowly, you know, I, I won't see it uh, exactly all, but maybe in 15 years they'll say, yeah, that was interesting what you were trying to do. And so you always hope that that's going to be the, but uh, none of you uh, made films that were tame or, uh, or, uh, or uh, according to the mold. So you should all be also, all be proud and, and do that throughout your whole careers, I hope. Thank you, thank you. <coughs> do you, do, we could talk about the conversation or we could talk about one from the heart. Which would you rather do? Anything. Okay. Um, because I, you, I remember you, you talking about all these fantastic collaborations that you've had and given so much credit to Gordon Willis and the authors of these books and all these sorts of things. But I remember reading something that you said about One from the Heart where your original intention was to make m more of a live television show. Um, but that in collaboration with the people that you were collaborating with, that, had, that you had been collaborating with, that, that something something had changed, that you started listening to them maybe too much, and that they were dr drifting it away from your original intention. Talk about that slow sort of... Well, how well, well I have to say that many people have asked me, uh, you know, what, do you regret anything? And, and I really don't. Uh, I, I don't regret 
my life. I, mean, I re pretty much did everything I wanted to do. I mean, I've been doing it. I, I never, but I have two regrets. Uh, one regret is, uh, one from the heart was planned and built. The sets were built uniquely in, in such a way. Everything was, I mean, why would you build half of Las Vegas in a soundstage for any <laughs> other reason than the fact that it was planned to be live television? The concept was to have, you know, eight cameras, and the silverfish was nothing more, the famous silverfish was nothing more than the control booth, and the sound, uh, the sound uh, uh, mixer and, and, and artist was, uh, was set up right there to do the sound effects live. And I said, if John, if John Frankenheimer can make a masterpiece like the comedian with Mickey Rooney and Mel Torme, if you ever, ever saw the comedian, which is live, television at the most extraordinary, or do these big productions like um, uh, Farewell to Arms live. I mean, to do a, whatever that was, an hour and a half, but it wasn't just like sort of, you know, little room like Marty and, you know, which was also very beautiful. The, the, these Frankenheim movies were cinematic, but they were live. They were, they, they were <coughs> shot live, and I said, I want to do that. I want to sit and say, camera six, camera four, and, mm -hmm. and uh, do that. So we, I, I bought that studio and I built the Silverfish, which was nothing more than an electronic uh, con control room like for Saturday Night Live, really. And uh, the idea was, of course, the film was still 10 minutes because it was still filmed, but the cameras all had uh, monitor uh, cameras on them, which was really beginning, kicked off the video assist uh, thing, which is now part of every, every film, although it was invented truly by Jerry Lewis. I have stories about that too someday. And, um, and make it <coughs> as live TV, and the sets were all built, so the continuity of the, the reason why there was half of Las Vegas and all the things that were so absurd to do if it was just gonna be a movie shot, I mean, you could shoot it in Las Vegas, you know. But as we got close, about three weeks to D-Day, and it was scary, you know, to do this, but it cost a lot of money to prepare it to be able to be shot live. Uh, all of the, the things I was talking about, the fact that every inch of it was built on a stage and that it had all these uh, multiple cameras and all that was sort of new, new kind of thinking in those days. About three weeks before I started hearing from Vittorio, Francis, Francis, you know, I could do some more beautiful lighting if I could just shoot one camera at a time, and I could do it very fast, <laughs> you know. And I said, but that, the, the, the whole idea of it was to try to do live, live cinema, mm -hmm. which I still think will happen. Someone will do it, and I want to see it. And uh, How would that work? How would it work? Yeah, like where do you see it live? On TV or anywhere? No, no, you make it live. In other words, you don't edit it. You, 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 you say, okay... Go. <clears throat> Here we go, and we do a performance that run right through the whole movie. And we could, we really could only do 10 minutes at a time because there was not what there is today. But the idea was to do 10 <clears throat> and one or two reels in one from the heart are like that, like the second reel when, uh, I know there's some scenes and then you have the two characters in one scene and then the scrim gives away and there's two other characters and it's like a whole 10 minute scene with one shot. My idea was the whole movie was going to be made with live performances and uh, live television techniques and, and, and not edited when it was done. It would be sort of dusted off and that would be it. What, so, so Victorio basically had never done that and, and it's like kind of what, what you said was the people that you love and love to work with, uh, you know, I, I would have had to have the courage and then Dean came to me and said, oh, Brandon, we could do this, we could do that, why are we doing it live? So I, I ultimately caved in and we shot it pretty much. And we had some of the, the original intention, but we shot it and then we had, so all the money I had spent to be able to do it uh, live, then I had to add to that all the money to do a regular post-production to cut it all together and ended up costing much more. And, and uh, the reason I, it's the one thing I regret is because it was an experiment that I had everything ready for maybe I never would be possible for me again, and I didn't push the button and do it. I would have had to fire Victorio and, and hire the guy who does Saturday Night Live, or, you know, I mean, someone who knew how to do it. What's the other one? The other regret is not something totally my fault, but it's a regret of my life is that you, 
you, the young people who we are so blessed. I mean, the United States, not to mention the world, has such a crop of talent who are there, you and even coming up on your short trails, whom you mean so much to them. And my only regret is that we were so passionate and serious about it there in the 70s in San Francisco and stuff, and I would have wanted to leave to the next generation a film business that more embraced them and encouraged them than, better than what we had. And what we had wasn't good, but it was better than what we're leaving. And that's a regret. Yeah. Was it an inevitable process, or do you think something could have been done? We became rich and famous and powerful. Why didn't we, what was it, how did it slip away, that, you know, that opportunity to, to, you know, it's not that I think that all films have to be experimental or all, it just seems to me that there's, cinema is big enough that it can have entertainment and wonderful films that people enjoy that they don't have to figure out what Tim Roth was talking about and <laughs> you know I mean there's enough there's enough it's big enough that it can do that and entertain and be thrilling and fun and 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 give film for this but it also part of it has to be dedicated to personal work and somewhat experimental work or it won't grow it won't it won't change you know and it does because the young generations they just make it happen I don't know they use their uncle's credit cards or whatever they do but I would have if I, if I could have if I could have had more to say about what it would be like you know, there would still be something it would be United Artists would not be destroyed as it was destroyed and United Artists was really when you think about it it was a wonderful institution made so many beautiful films and that, you know, that library is still dazzling the, the, that happened under Arthur Krim and, uh, and, and his team. There's, there's no United Artists anymore. It should just one of, there can be seven, eight companies, but one should be like United Artists. I just, that's my regret. <coughs> You've also given us Sofia Coppola and Roman Coppola, which is pretty good. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe they will join together. They they certainly were raised in a, in a great tradition. They just they didn't only have me around, but you think of all of their who they think are their uncles and aunts was a wonderful tradition of of filmmakers and and uh, you know you know maybe it doesn't maybe you don't ever really just give it to the next generation. The next generation has to seize it for themselves, which I think they're doing. We have, we have, you know, I can name talented directors. I would have need uh, 10 sets of hands to name them all on it. It's almost like that period in Italy where there were so many great directors that you maybe, well, there were 40 in that one period there from after the war into the, you know, so I, I think that we have it here. It's just that we don't have any, you know, in the studios, I had the pleasure to work for people like Jack Warner, and I mean, they were characters, but they were really showmen and they loved movies. Sort of like Harvey. Harvey, Harvey is a guy, I mean, he, he, he's a character like they were and tough and God knows what, but he really loves movies, I think. And that they were all like that. So that now the, the studios are really owned by uh, people telecom companies and bigger, bigger, bigger deal, bigger me media plays as they were. But in the, in, in, in even in my era, <coughs> they were, they were, they were showmen, they were showmen. And we don't have that tradition quite now in the ownership of the studios. And, you, and that, that was a good tradition. I remember uh, Sam Goldwyn. Sam Goldwyn was really funny. I won the Goldwyn Prize when I was a kid. And uh, I got it, and, <clears throat> and so every year, Mr. Goldwyn would want me to come and visit him. So I'd go back there in uh, his studio on Formosa, and uh, he was a little guy, and he'd talk like I'm going to talk. I'm not making fun of him. He'd, he'd talk like that. <laughs> so I missed a couple of you are Goldwyn scholar. I really admire you. I admire your talent. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm now going gonna, gonna to direct. Direct? What do you want to direct for? You're a writer. Right, it's hard. You mean right, right, right. So, so <laughs> thank you, Mr. Goldwyn. <laughs> so I and I went and made you're a big boy now. And I got a call. Mr. Goldwyn would like to see you. He was a really sweet man. And I went there, went up there. 
Ah, Mr. Coble, you're a Goldwyn scholar. I'm so proud of you. You made this movie. I saw your movie. You're a big boy. I liked it, I liked it for its uh, spontaneity, he said. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it had a lot of spontaneity. <laughs> Thank you. So what are you doing now? I said, well, Mr. Goldwyn, I'm going to write a new script. Write? What do you want to be a writer for? <laughs> <laughs> You're a director. Direct, direct, direct. You can hire ten writers. <laughs> But, but I got to work for, you know, Jack Warner, uh, Daryl Zanuck, all these, these, these legendary figures that got to meet Adolf Zucker and, and all those wonderful people. But they were, they, were the, they were the bosses, and they were tough and all that, but they, they were there, and they, and they wanted to make beautiful movies uh, and, and make money at it, of course. But it was a different climate. Now, now you don't know who's really... The stock market is in. Charge. Were you able to have friendships with directors that you'd admired growing up that were sort of starting to get old at that time? So, in, like the John Ford's or the Howard Hawks, people like that. And to, 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 I did to, have to communicate. So, some them. were very giving and 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 uh, and great and and and, and helpful and, and and willing to you know read your script. Even Billy Wilder was one. He was just the most wonderful. He was very funny, but he was really uh, he was really available and. And that was uh, an encouraging and fun to talk to. And mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, Frank Capra, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting, I guess he was in getting in a bitter time of his own career because he wasn't able to get movies off the ground. But I remember, I, uh, you know, the, the, the cut of, uh, of Apocalypse was, you know, I was very unsure of what I was doing, as you can imagine. Or, and uh, Billy Wilder was very encouraging and gave me some good pointers. But when I showed it to Frank Capra, he just hated it. He just thought it was terrible and he got very kind of cranky on me, you know. And, <laughs> and then when I told him about my idea for Tucker, because I thought he would like Tucker, because it's kind of like a Frank Capra story, he would just put it down. He said, no, you can't have a story like that and the guy is not a success. He gets wiped out of business. That's not a Frank Capra movie, you know. <laughs> so he was... Uh, I thought he would have liked it, but Frank Capra was a great. Did you ever see The Bitter Tea of General uh, Yen no. by Frank Capra? Oh, beautiful. Uh, it's with Barbara Stanwyck. Uh, it's really. What year is that? That's got to be the late 30s, I would. Bitter Tea of General Yen. Did you ever see it? No. Oh, you'd like it. Barbara Stanwyck is something. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and I mean, it's a very modern, I mean, a very, you would not think it, you know, I think, because I. I've always loved that movie, but the, who, what other director? I, I got to meet. Uh, oh, you know who I spent a lot of time with was who was a great man was and talk about the directors go was King Vidor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I used to hang out with K King Vidor, and he used to love to go for walks with me in Paris, and he always wanted to walk uh, down uh, Pigalle, and he always talked about when he was a young man in Pigalle, and, and uh, he was a but he wanted to make a film, and, and unfortunately. Most of the older directors that I so admired, including Wells, they couldn't, they couldn't get to make a movie. Uh, King Vidor wanted to make a movie, and we were trying to help him so he could make it. And, and I know um, Wells wanted to make a film and couldn't. It, it seems like, you know, that that, that, that is part of the last act of, uh, of movie directors is, you know, the, the D.W. Griffith end where he sat in the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel and get drinks from people and tell them that he used to be a famous movie director. D.W. Griffith, if you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, of course, Kurosawa was, was he did have a, uh, thanks to George Lucas and, and to myself to some extent, the, uh, Kurosawa wasn't able to get films and, and we helped to uh, uh, we help, uh, especially after Star Wars, to to get him to do Kagemusha, and then he had a whole other period. Thank, thanks, that we have those films. You know, Ron, Kagemusha. When we were putting this evening together, you wanted to <coughs> talk about Jack and maybe share a clip. One well, I, 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 I said, I said, you know, I said, if you're going to honor a director, I said you should show what everyone says is his worst film. I mean. <laughs> You can always go and show the ones that were successful, but what, what about the ones, and, and I just, I, I know when someone wants to be mean to me or whatever, they always like say, hey, do you 
you know, he, this is the guy who made Jack. So I said, why don't you, you know, show that, you know? And <laughs> I should be put on spot and you should say, why, <laughs> why did you do that? Okay. So well, what went wrong? <laughs> you know what, uh, I think uh, the reason I, I, I did it was uh, that was that period between uh, 40 and 50 where I, I literally had to make a movie every year. That's hard to do, to make this payment I had, and that's how I was able to hang on to our home in uh, Napa. That was what was up at stake. And uh, so I, I paid off that loan. It took me 10 years, and I made, you know, Peggy Sue got married. And, but Jack was... Uh, Jack was, uh, the truth of the matter is that I, uh, I would have done anything that Robin Williams wa was doing because I just thought he was such an uh, interesting guy and a, a brilliant person and, and very intelligent and stuff. And that was a project he was doing. I, I always thought it was a dumb idea to make a movie from because it's the same idea of Big, which was such a wonderful movie and so successful. And I never knew why they would want to do another one about a big kid, but... Uh, you know, I had to make a movie every year, and I really liked uh, uh, Robin Williams. And I think, you know, the, often in, the, in any profession, there are things you have to do, and, and I think you have, to f you have to find something to love about everything you do. You know, you, I always I joke that if you're going to be a prostitute, which often in the film business you have to be if you uh, <laughs> want to get through what you have to do, but, you know, you know so... You have to find something about what you're doing that's, you know, that you can love, that you can like. And in this case, I, um, you know, I, there was a theme in that story that I, that I felt was uh, personal uh, to me. And, uh, and as I said, I wanted to, but it was a, it was a pre-made thing. I mean, they had the script, they had the prior, I just came on as uh, the director. It wasn't a matter of like I could rewrite the whole thing. Not that I would have known how to, really, to be honest with you. That's how the, that's how Jack came about. But uh, and you you've been very self-effacing tonight. I'm always self-effacing. What, what 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 are you most proud of? My children. <laughs> In terms of a work, a piece of work or something. Yeah. I of course I'm more one one of the reasons. Uh, you know I'm 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 favor the, the stuff I got to write, and I didn't get to write. I, my original idea of a career back there in, when we started and everything, was the early days of Zoetrope was, you know, to make these more personal films, like The Rain People was the early one, and, and to, to write and make films about things that I wanted to learn about. Because when you make a film, you just learn so much about it, and if it's personal, it means you're gonna learn also about yourself. Uh, and uh, then my, I, I had the interesting accident of making The Godfather, which totally changed my life and put me in a, a position that I never imagined I was really going to be in. And, and then little by little, I wasn't writing those personal films, and I was always hoping you know, if I could make one big success, you know, I could, then I'd have all this money, and then I'd just spend that money making films like George always tells me he's going to do. <laughs> George, George Lucas is a very interesting experimental filmmaker and he's going to shock everybody because he's got the dough. <laughs> he's just going to go off and make a film someday and uh, you know he's, he's, he has enormous talent that you know making big movies that do what they do is one thing but he has a very exotic side of him which I would love to see and, and he promises me he's, he's going to do it and I believe him. But um, you know, so I, I realized I was never, movie business is a terrible kind of a business, really more of a hobby financially because somehow the money all goes in the hopper and by the time it gets to you, it's all gone. <laughs> so I, I did one of my very clever Houdini routines and, and when I realized that, I slid into another industry, which is a business. Mm. And, which, and, then, and the irony is that the money I use now to make these little films are, don't come from anything to do with the movie business. It comes from the wine business. So that's how I, how, that's how I finance my films. But now getting a release is very tricky. You know, even if you've paid for the movie, then who, you know. And the public has been carefully, you know, 40 years of television, and, and, and the, the public is... Uh, tastes aside from 
on the fringes of interesting pictures. They, you know, they they want a certain kind of film that they've been that they've been uh, taught to to want. Well, this has been a wonderful evening, hasn't it? Yeah. So. Yeah. So thank you very much, like Francis, and thank you three too. Oh, we know. You've been, uh, been an inspiration to us. So. Oh, thank you. And you continued it tonight, and thank you so. Thank you thank all. You thank coming. you for coming. Thank you.